So hello and welcome to this MPTL course entitled uh, Trauma and Literature. We have already begun to study uh, Kathy Malibu's book, The Ontology of the Accident. We've had an introductory lecture to this book and we will just carry on today for where we left last time. So we saw how uh, she's defining the, the concept and experience of accident as something which falls outside the uh, parameters of language, uh, parameters of definition, parameters of expression. Uh, and she's almost giving a clarion call in terms of how we should resituate accident as not something outside, but something which happens. And uh, obviously, she talks about uh, plasticity, destructive plasticity, as a very important, uh, a very crucial category in the case of trauma, uh, in a sense that it creates a disconnect. Destructive plasticity creates a disconnect from any uh, erstwhile expression, from any erstwhile order of things. Uh, and this ontological disconnect is something which Malibu talks about uh, very, very um, um, vocally in this book, uh, The Ontology of the Accident. Because the whole idea of the accident is something uh, being outside of ontology is something that she uh, is trying to uh, deconstruct. She's trying to give an ontology to the accident, right? And she says that there, there's a form of destructive plasticity which needs to be acknowledged uh, as an experience, as a, as a concept. Uh, as a lived experience, something which departs uh, dramatically, uh, vividly, and almost uh, completely uh, from any erstwhile order, uh, any erstwhile ontological order of things. Now, in this section uh, that we will cover today, and this is page 14 of this book, which should be on your screen, uh, we will see how Malibu talks about uh, certain uh, literary and cultural examples in terms of how we can see the idea of the accident or the experience of the accident is something which departs dramatically from any order of uh, uh, beings performed. And as we can understand by now, this is very, very interestingly linked to trauma uh, because the very experience of trauma, the very um, concept of trauma, the very event of trauma is a departure from the normative order uh, or creates or generates a departure from the normative order. Uh, in a sense, it breaks away to such an extent that it cannot be connected again to anything that uh, preceded it. So we talk about trauma victims as changed personalities, as people with a different reconfigured uh, expression, reconfigured ontological orders, etc. Now, uh, in this section, she talks about how there are certain cultural examples, some literary examples, which try to appropriate or try to approximate uh, this condition, and this should be on your screen, uh, page 14 of this book. Uh, the crisis of the mid-1980s in France was a crisis of connection, a crisis that gave social exclusion its full meaning. So again, uh, the idea of social exclusion is something that she talks about, and she says mid-1980s France, and obviously she's a French theorist, so she gives examples from home. Uh, it was a crisis of connection, so there was this, you know, dramatic disconnect that people felt um, in the 1980s France. And this is also the time, if you remember, uh, which was sort of the heyday uh, of post-structuralism, which of course began from the 1960s, but it continued uh, mid-1980s. There were social, cultural conditions which were very, very resonant uh, to the theory of deconstruction, to the theory of uh, uh, exclusion or disconnect. Uh, now, what that did was, and this is what Malibu is saying, it revolutionized the uh, concepts of unhappiness and trauma and provoked a social upheaval whose extent we are only beginning to measure today, right? So the idea of happiness, uh, unhappiness and, and, and trauma, and th that became a social condition and wasn't just a private experiential condition, it was more or less an extended shared condition, right? The um, uh, concept of unhappiness. Uh, and we're just about to uh, measure the uh, beginning of that kind of uh, uh, traumatic condition, the, the kind of an unhappy condition. Uh, so what kind of unhappiness Malibu talks about? What kind of exclusion Malibu talks about? Now, mind you, these are very real social examples that she's offering. The jobless, the homeless, the sufferers of post-traumatic stress syndrome, the deeply depressed, the victims of natural catastrophes, all began to resemble one another as a new international whose physiognomy I tried to describe in a new wounded. So if you remember, this is a book which we have just finished before we came to uh, this work, The Ontology of the Accident. Prior to that, we finished The New Wounded. Now in that, uh, in that work, The New Wounded, Malibu talks about the wound, again, the idea of the wound as a departure from the norm, as a departure from the normal normative condition. Now, 
the new one that it almost has a, a demographic quality to it, as you can understand. It almost talks about a population of people, uh, a section of people, a section of society uh, who are sort of co-sufferers and sharers of this wound. Now, by wound, Malibu is not talking about just some theoretical uh, uh, condition. She's talking about some very social conditions such as joblessness, homelessness, um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder victims, uh, and people suffering depressions, um, deep psychological depression, uh, victims of catastrophe, so again, uh, disaster survivors. Uh, they all began to resemble one another. It's almost like a community of uh, sufferers, community of co-sufferers. Right, so this is the uh, demography that she had mentioned in New Wonder, and you can see how she's trying to connect that uh, to the idea of the accident. So these are people who are uh, not really the, the normative citizens. These are people who are not really the functional citizens, but people who are, you know, seen as dissidents, seen as dysfunctional, uh, seen as uh, a problem, a threat, uh, a trouble uh, to the uh, functioning and conditioning of a productive society. So again, we can see how this concept can be connected very quickly uh, to a text like Mrs. Jalloway, which we have covered, or even for the matter to Toba Teik Seng, again a text we have covered in this course, in terms of how uh, the wounded and the depressed and the uh, people who suffered an accident, uh, they can be seen as uh, embodying and exhibiting a condition uh, that is you know, a departure from any normative condition or any normal functioning condition before. From supposed traumatic subjectivity, as Zizek calls it, new figures are uh, the void or of identitarian uh, abandonment who elude most therapies, especially psychoanalysis, right? So she's uh, quoting Zizek, uh, she's saying that this, this embodies or this is an example of post traumatic subjectivity, right? The idea of the subject, the experience of the subject, subjecthood of the self. This is a post traumatic subjectivity. It's almost like a spatial condition, or shall we say a spatio-temporal condition, post-traumatic, after trauma. And the subjectivity almost has a territorial quality. It's like space of people, a space of the mind, uh, which is one of um, you know, unsettledness, uh, as it were. And these are new figures of the void or of uh, identitarian abandonment, so a complete abandonment of identity. Uh, again, almost post-identity, so post-trauma, post-identity, uh, almost a liquidation of identity, um, a closure of identity, um, so to speak, who elude most therapy, especially psychoanalysis. So this uh, illusion, so they're eluding uh, any kind of therapy, uh, especially psychoanalysis. So they are uh, almost outside the medical parameters, uh, the medical practices of cure uh, and coercion, uh, if we could add that as well. So, you know, these are the people that Malibu is identifying as embodying uh, the accident, embodying the trauma, the wound, the wounded people, right? So, as you can see, she talks about wound or accident, not just as a medical condition, but as social, cultural conditions, which inform deeply, you know, the, the psychological situatedness or the desituatedness of these people, because at some level, there is a deterritorialization. So these are people, these are subjects who have been deterritorialized in the sense they don't really are, they don't, they're no longer rooted in any territory, they're not really rooted in any space, right? So this deterritorialization is an important phenomenon of trauma, so to speak. Uh, so, and then she goes on to um, uh, a literary example, which should be on the screen, a Kafka's Metamorphosis. So Kafka's metamorphosis is the most successful, beautiful, and relevant attempt to approach this kind of accident, right? So this transformation to something else. Now, the section which is coming up is uh, uh, the reason why I've chosen this section, because this is very directly related to the content or the philosophy of this course, which is literature and trauma. So you have the Kafka uh, story, the metamorphosis, which I believe most of us have read here, uh, and Malibu is attempting a reading of it in a way which is interesting because in the story, talk, story talks about an accident, a transformation, uh, a deterritorialization, so to speak. The subject becomes something else uh, for the matter. But what is also interesting equally is how Malibu is bringing the idea that this is not really a complete transformation because the subject is still speaking. There is still some residual connect with the earlier subject. Yes, the, the figure has changed, the body has changed, the, uh, the physiognomy has changed, but there is some uh, residual ontological order left, which lends its voice 
to the new subject, right? So the uh, the post accident subject still retains to a certain extent the older voice. So in that sense, um, the metamorphosis is not a perfect example of the accident. It's not the perfect example of trauma or the new wonder, but then it, it comes very close to approximating that condition uh, through a literary um, you know device. Okay, and then she is quoting someone. Uh, called Blancott, uh, and then she's saying that, uh, you know, how the metamorphosis becomes, uh, you know, interesting, uh, but in a sense, you know, like I mentioned, it is uh, still an inadequate and incomplete example. Right. So, uh, Blancott puts it well, and then there's a quotation uh, in the next page, uh, which should be on the screen. Uh, the state in which Gregor finds himself is the same state of that of being unable to quit existence. One for him uh, to exist is to be condemned to always fall back into existence. Becoming vermin, he continues to live in the mode of degeneration. He digs deeper into animal solitude. He moves closer still to absurdity and the impossibility of living. But what happens? He just keeps on living, right? So, as you can see, living and this reading, living becomes uh, uh, you know, an existence which is just terrible, uh, terrifying and uh, traumatic in a certain sense. Uh, he's unable to quit existence. So he becomes something else, but it still retains existence. He still exists in a certain sense. Uh, and uh, the key word in this section is absurdity. Uh, and those of us who have read Absurd Theatre would know that is, you know, becoming something else through an absurd process uh, is something which comes quite close to what Malibu talks about, at least symbolically, into becoming a different organism, dif becoming a different personality. So, you know, if you remember something like Ionos goes rhinoceros, uh, where people become rhinoceros because, you know, that just becomes an embodiment of boredom and ennui uh, and inaction and passiveness and numbness uh, to a certain extent, right? So. Kafka's metamorphosis seems to approximate that kind of a condition. And again, that's connected to the theory of metamorphosis, the theory of accident that Malibu is proposing over here. Uh, metamorphosis is existence itself, untying identity instead of reassembling it. So again, it's an untying of identity instead of reassembling it. Gregor's awakening at the beginning of the story is a perfect expression of destructive plasticity, right? This is a and Malibu picks this as a, as a literary example of destructive plasticity. The inexplicable nature of this transformation into an insect continues to fascinate us as a possible danger, a threat for each of us. Who knows if tomorrow. Right, so the transformation into an insect, so this is a degeneration which has been uh, created by destructive plasticity. So the complete uh, erosion of the self uh, the erosion of the uh, old ontological order and becoming something else uh, entirely, right? And uh, the inexplicability of it, the absurdity of it is something which is, uh, you know, is more uh, fearful in a certain sense. I mean, that's more scary. It's possibility of danger, right? This constant production of the possibility of danger. And of course, the uh, the empathy that we have uh, is also a threat for us. And what if we become that? What if this happens to us? Right? So, uh, through a symbolic spiritual process, we become a different organism altogether. Right? So, you know, this is something which uh, Malibu says. It's a very good example, a very close example. Uh, you know, it approximates uh, the metamorphosis to a large extent. But this is where the caveat comes in, and Malibu says it's not really the perfect example because they still they, they retain the old humanist voice, which still continues to speak, and, and she makes becomes uh, a little metafictional away, uh, and she says that uh, well, the spider, the insect, manages to cocoon and weave something around him, give a structure uh, to his existence, and a structure is a story metamorphosis by Kafka. So again, we are becoming metafictional away, uh, but the. Uh, you know, the, the protection of the story is something that it, you know, the, the voice manages to have. It, it manages to tell you a story, right? And this is what Malibu uh, is saying. But the monster does manage to weave a cocoon, a cocoon which slowly becomes the text. The text is a metamorphosis, and this metamorphosis is completed by us, the readers, right? So there is a sense of uh, completion, which is also a connect, right? So as you can see, there's a textual quality about transformation, and Malibu is foregrounding that quality as well. That, you know, the fact that uh, the spider or the insect manages to tell a story uh, or be part of a story, uh, it, it retains a certain structural comfort uh, 
right? And that structural comfort is closed by the text, right? The you know, text is metamorphosis. And of course, when we are reading it as readers, we ascribe a certain kind of meaning to it, right? And that meaning completes the structure in a certain sense. So a circle of plastic possibilities in some sense closes here again, right? So plastic possibilities come together and there's a circle. The narrative voice is not entirely that of an insect. So there is this humanist quality to it. The, the human is retained at some level. The narrative voice retains the humanist quality to it, uh, which gives it a story like structure. The invisible butterfly has a, a non bestial voice, uh, the voice of a man, the voice of a writer, right? So and that, that voice is important. The disembodied voice is important. I mean, yes, the body of the man has disappeared, but the voice retains. And in that sense, it manages to re-embody itself, right, as a humanist, uh, you know, humanist spirit, right? Uh, what is a metamorphosis that can still speak itself, write itself? Uh, that does not remain entirely unique even when it experiences itself as such. So the fact that it, it is able to narrate itself, able to describe itself, uh, is the indication that it's not really a metamorphosis in a fuller sense. There is some kind of a connect to the earlier self and there's some memory lingering from the earlier self spilling you know, over into a story. Right? And that the spilling over from memory to story is important over here because at the end it, dis, it does tell you a story. Gregor Samsa becomes an insect. Right, uh, and then you know that becomes uh, you know part of the story. The textual weaving happens. As Kafka writes in her letters, art is no salvation, yet it can preserve. Uh, after all, uh, one can't help recognizing Daphne's bark in Gregor. So Daphne is a, is a Greek allusion, uh, and again, it's about metamorphosis. It's about you know, transforming itself to something else. Okay, uh, and now the next section where uh, Malibu talks about delusious, uh, just delusious reading of uh, Kafka's story, uh, Metamorphosis, and you know, Deleuze said that Kafka fails in the story uh, to really talk about Metamorphosis in a fuller sense, and Malibu seems to uh, agree, at least partially, with uh, Deleuze's reading of Metamorphosis, and this should be on the screen. If Deleuze's reading of the Metamorphosis is unfair when it concludes that Kafka fails, it is not entirely wrong. On the one hand, Deleuze recognizes the, uh, the effectiveness of the becoming animal of Gregor, his becoming beetle, uh, Junberg, a dungle beetle, cockroach, with traces, uh, which traces an intense line of flight in relation to the familial triangle, but especially in relation to the bureaucratic and commercial triangle. The result of the metamorphosis is precisely a being in flight, one who constitutes a way out of the self forming a single process, a unique method that replaces subjectivity. On the other hand, Deleuze also sees the exemplary story of re -edipalization. In this metamorphosis, a trajectory that remains trapped in this family triangle, father, mother, sister. Uh, given over to this becoming animal, Gregor finds himself re edipalized by his family and goes to his death. Gregor's death returns the metamorphosis to the order of things, in some sense uh, annulling it. The family will not have been metamorphos metamorphosized, and Gregor will not have stopped recognizing the family, calling namely his father, his mother, his sister. In other words, uh, the Oedipal structure, the kinship structure, the libidinal kinship structure is retained in metamorphosis, right? So uh, it becomes an act of re -edipalization. and. Because of Deleuze, uh, it's interesting to relate this to Deleuze's own theory of deterritorialization followed by re-territorialization. So yes, there is a deterritorialization, there's a departure from the earlier order, but it's also a weaving back to an, an old order, re-territorialization. It is reclaiming the territory, it's reclaiming the lost space and time, it's reclaiming the structure uh, to a certain extent. And that familial kinship structure returns in the end, especially with Gregor's death. Uh, it goes back to the order of things uh, to a certain extent. But Deleuze attributes a failure of the metamorphosis to the fact that it concerns an adventure in form, the adventure of an uh, identifiable animal. Gregor becomes a beetle. Uh, for Deleuze, a true metamorphosis would be a metamorphosis that, despite its name, would have uh, nothing to do with the becoming form. According to him, as long as there is form, there is still re This is exactly what I meant. So, you know, the, the fact that it has a form, 
Uh, yes, it's an insect, it's a different form from the earlier human form, but it still has a form. And that having a form always creates a potential possibility of re-territorialization. It can go back and reclaim a structure or restructure itself, or, or to lose as put it, uh, re edipolize itself into some kind of a kinship network, libidinal kinship network. So this is why the becoming animal is not becoming an animal. The first is an arrangement. The second is a form, uh, which, which can do nothing but freeze becoming, right? So uh, becoming animal is a process of unbecoming, but becoming an animal uh, is a product, right? It becomes a structure. It, it sort of goes back and reclaims the structure. Uh, and in the process, it, it freezes becoming. So the, the transformation stops because there is a form that has appeared. There is a form that is fixated, that's frozen. And that form may be different from the earlier form, but then it is still a form. And in that sense, it can then recreate a territory around it, recreate a kinship network around it, recreate a libidinal system around it. And that is why, according to Deleuze, um, the Kafka story is a failure uh, of destructive plasticity. Of course, Deleuze doesn't say destructive plasticity, but it is a failure of metamorphosis. So in that sense, uh, you know, uh, Malibu is obviously picking on it, and Malibu is saying this is actually a failure because you know, at the end uh, there is some validity in Deleuze's reading of metamorphosis. So I stop at this point today. It's a short session, but I hope you know it's quite loaded if you think about it. Uh, but I hope this makes sense. We are taking a Kafka story, which uh, uh, you know, Malibu is saying it approximates the, the whole concept of destructive plasticity in a very embodied form. But at the same time, it's also showing us, uh, you know, true Deleuze that how this deterritorialization becomes a form, becomes a shape, becomes an order, and in the process it begins to become the, you know, the re-territorializing quality. It begins to re-territorialize, reclaim a structure. So in that sense, there is always a structure, right? So it, it has a form, it has a story, it has a text woven around it. And the wovenness of the text, the structure of the text, uh, makes it uh, an animal. So it can be a different animal, but then the process of becoming comes to an end because it has become an animal. There is a frozen nest to it, a frozen frame uh, to it, and that just gives it, you know, it, it, it manages to make it, uh, you know, a re edipolized version of its earlier self. So I'll stop at this point today, and we'll just continue uh, this work from the next session. Thank you for your attention.